Welcome to Beginning Painting. And the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is a concept that is uh, really basic to image making to me, to the idea of expressing myself or expressing oneself through paint. And that is the idea of energy versus structure. I'm going to start off with a painter, um, sort of a, a painter's painter, John Singer Sargent. This is one of his most famous paintings. It's in the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. It's a huge painting. The figure of the flamenco dancer, um, as I recollect, is very close to life size. Very big uh, painting, full of energy, full of movement, full of magic for me. Um, to me, I think, you know, when I look at this painting, it's, it's difficult to imagine um, how he got there, I think, how anybody could create something this masterful and moving, um, especially as we approach it from the perspective of a beginning painter, right? So um, I've used this, if you've ever been in one of my drawing classes, you've seen this painting before because I, um, I show it to my drawing students too. One of the reasons that I use it is that we not only have his painting, but we also have the studies that he did from it. And these, I think, are much more approachable, right? You can see that he spent a lot of time studying uh, flamenco dancers, right? He probably had these models in his studio, or he may have been in a flamenco tavern in Spain somewhere, I don't know, but he did travel in Europe a lot, John Singer, Sargent. Um, but anyway, these drawings, I think, um, feel like something that almost anybody could draw, right? Now, if you look at, say, this, uh, this central figure here, the face is, is uh, captured in just a few marks, just a few lines. Obviously, that's, you know, very masterful. But then look at the way the torso is drawn. It could be a, a ball of tangled yarn, right? It could be anything. I think um, it, it's pretty clear that that part of the drawing, at least, is much more about his body's energy. He's racing, stabbing, slashing with his pencil, drawing as hard as he can, responding to the movement of the dancer, right? And in all of these drawings, look how he draws the arm again and again, right? Look how he draws the torso and the little rear end here again and again, trying to um, trying to get that feeling that the clothing is flying, the arms are flailing, the legs are moving, right? Everything is in motion. Very, very beautiful. As we go on to look at the paintings that he did as studies, these are oil paintings and they look like they're on little sheets of primed paper, primed with orange shellac, very likely. Already, of course, you can see much more structure to these figures. They're much more similar to the ones in the final painting. And yet, we feel a little bit of that same feeling that we felt in the drawings, right? So look at the way I'm, I uh, hope you can see my cursor here. Look at the slashing motion of the um, original black shapes or dark shapes that were, that were laid down here. And then he put these slashes of red on top of them to just barely indicate where a sash is or the lining of a cape. Look at the way um, the negative shape next to that figure, it just slashed in. It looks like it probably took him just seconds, fractions of seconds, to make some of these marks, right? So if you look at this elbow here, it looks very, very much, I mean, it reminds me very much of those tangled skeins of yarn. If you look at this face, you can see that he has spent a little more time on it, slowed his tempo down a little bit, built it up, shown us the light and shade, given us a little bit more, and yet we can see that it's not very different from this face, and this face is not very different from those pencil drawings, right? And then go on to some much more detailed studies that he made for the final figure, the, the central figure, the flamenco dancer. Here we have a quick um, watercolor study. Sargent was a fantastic watercolorist, uh, very, very fluent. Um, and then an oil study. You'll notice that the negative shape is really important to him here. He's, he's working out the idea of maybe a big shadow behind her, that her 
her body is going to disappear into and that her skirt is going to flare out against and, and contrast. Um, he's studying the complicated um, movement of the arms here and the way this hand is going to be a focal point. Right? He's figuring out how he wants the folds of the fabric to fall and how he wants the shawl to fly. Notice how much freer the watercolor study is and how much more structured right, the oil paint study is. And now let's go back to the final piece. This is the much, much larger painting that hangs in the museum. And let's just take, now that we're a little bit uh, educated in this process, let's take a little tour around it. Right? Here's that shadow that he was playing with in the studies. It's changed its shape a little bit. Now it looks as if it's being cast by the figure on a wall. We can see her arm, the shadow of her arm here, right? The shadow of her head. Spooky. It's, uh, uh, it, it no longer is the same value as her, as her torso here. But, uh, but we do see that, it, that same effect that he was playing with before, the shadow swallowing up these figures here. Right? We see the um, hand very, very carefully studied, very, very crisply painted, the face really accented with that bright light coming up from below, the, the uh, arm uh, uh, very uh, dramatically lit, much more than in the studies. Look at the way the fabric of her skirt turned out. Let's go back to the studies and look. Those last studies. Look at the crispness of the way he depicts it in the study, and look at the way he's let some of that crispness fall away. He's let some of the edges get a little softer. He's let some of the folds of the fabric go back into the shadow. He's used some uh, bravura brush strokes, some very, very uh, juicy, flashy brush strokes to render some things that were rendered a little more tightly and carefully in the study. In other words, he's let go of some of that structure, right? Why would he do that? Ask yourself that. Look at a guy who could paint a hand like this. Why would he paint a guitar like that? He could at least have painted it like this, right? <laughs> he is pulling his punches in a lot of places in this painting, right? Obviously, he wants us to focus on the dancer and not to focus on the technique that he's using in rendering the guitar pegs and the guitar strings, right? Um, he wants us to focus on her face rather than these faces in the background here. Oh, he gives us plenty here to interest ourselves in, right? As we, as we move along these lines of figures, he gives us lots and lots to look at, but he's directing our eye where he wants us to go. And he wants this to be about movement. I feel that this final figure with uh, the looseness and the drama of the brush strokes has even more movement in it than that carefully studied oil study does. And I wouldn't change a thing about this painting. I see energy and structure as a dialectic that the painter is constantly working with, constantly thinking about. And I think it's very clear in that series of, of Sargent drawings that I've shown you that those two things, although they are very different and they work against each other in some ways, they also are both really, really important, right? It's much more satisfying to look at that final painting with all its complex structure than it is to look at those beautiful little pencil drawings, wonderful as they are. They're all about energy. They don't have the structure that keeps us looking and keeps us interested and keeps us with our noses pressed up against the painting, walking away and coming back like you, like you do when you see it there in the flesh in the museum. So energy, we could say it's trademark is a fast tempo, you know, the artist is moving her arms, moving his hands, right? It's associated with skill, but it's, it's, not the, it's not the skill of fine motor skills, it's more the skill of the athlete, right? It's the, it's the lunging at the canvas, it's the knowing exactly how hard to 
hit the thing with your brush, right? Energy is about the gesture of the artist's hand. I, just, I wrote hand here, but I, I think I, it, it would be more accurate to say body. For that reason, energy points to the artist. It's, I think, the thing in the painting that really yields expression, that gives us that feeling that we're in touch with that artist, that that artist is speaking to us. Energy involves risk, because when you do things fast, you screw things up, right? It's, it's, you break things. It's, it's easy to make mistakes when uh, you're using lots of energy. And yet, without energy, you don't have expression. So no risk, no art, <laughs> right? Structure, on the other hand, of course, is, is one of the things that you're here in this class in order to acquire, right? Structure is associated with that slower tempo, using your fine motor skills, practicing things, right? Structure is what allows you to paint a hand the way Sargent painted, painted it. It gives us information about the world. Structure points to the subject. It helps you to create a likeness. It helps you to depict things, if that's how you want to paint. And, and that's how we're going to start, because it's a, um, it's a great way to get started in painting. It's not where you need to stop, but it's a great way to start. Structure is about control, right? And we do need that. To this class, you may have brought some skills, right? You may have brought some uh, some fine motor skills or even some drawing skills, some design skills, um, but you have definitely brought your body. You've brought the energy of your body. You have to use that energy when you paint and when you draw, of course, which you will often be doing as you prepare to paint. Um, you have to use that energy if you want to have expression. That's all there is to it. You can't avoid that risk. That's why I call it a dialectic. You need both those things. As we learn to uh, acquire structure, um, we can't let, leave that energy behind. I want to show you a couple of paintings by a couple of other artists that I, whose work I love, Edgar Degas and Mary Cassatt. They were contemporaries. Uh, Edgar Degas is French, and, uh, and Mary Cassatt, although she was American, she worked in France and uh, studied with Degas and, and became a friend and, and colleague of his, both wonderful painters. Um, I think there's a tendency for people to feel that um, you start with energy when you're young and you get structure and more and more skill as you get older, right? But with these two artists, it didn't work that way. And actually, there are lots of artists that I could show you <laughs> for whom it went in this direction. This is a, a painting that God did in 1873. Uh, it's a masterfully structured painting, I believe. I think I, I've counted 15 or 16 human figures in it, many of them depicted with portrait-like accuracy. I'm sure if you knew his models, you could identify who was who. Um, the, there's two-point perspective going on here, and it's immaculate. Uh, the only parallel lines to the edges of the canvas are the verticals, and, and everything else is, is uh, wonderfully uh, uh, aiming at vanishing points. The figures themselves are um, beautifully arranged in convincing perspective to using the same vanishing points as the architecture. And he gives us all these wonderful details about what the cotton office looked like and the um, kind of slice of life of these people looking at, uh, you know, examining cotton bowls and reading the cotton futures in the newspaper, I assume. That's all that sort of thing. Wonderful detail. Terrific painting. I'm going to show you a painting now that he did 13 or 14 years later. This is actually done with pastels, but that is technically a painting because he um, because pastels are are made with paint pigment um, this is one of many paintings he did at this period of, of women bathing and for me this painting is much more about energy than it is about structure it's still masterfully skillful when we look at the um, the oh the secondary highlights on the flesh here uh, uh, just the 
beautiful way the uh, little tiny indication of light coming through a window through translucent curtains. It's just heartbreakingly beautiful, but it is so full of the movement of his hand and his body. It's so immediate in its response to this woman's figure and her um, simple, vigorous action. Um, it's so much less about structure. He's let so much of that skill go. He's not trying to impress us with that. He's speaking much more directly to our hearts, I feel, in this painting. Same with Mary Cassatt. This is a painting she did in 1873, about the same time that Degas was doing his uh, Cotton Office painting. And I would suggest that many people would not recognize this as a Mary Cassatt because it's so unlike what she's famous for. It's extremely skillful, highly structured. This could almost be a, um, an advertisement for a painter who's good at painting fabric and embroidery and lace and translucent objects and portraits and textures and it's it's like a miracle of technique but it's not the kind of work that made Mary Cassatt famous. Hold your breath. <laughs> so this is only what I forgot the date on my last one six or seven years later and during that time she stopped worrying so much about structure. Of course, she had all those skills, so she could sit down in a theater box with her sister with a box of pastels and move her arms so fast you could probably hardly see her fingers. That's how I feel when I look at this. And uh, use her body's energy to respond right from her heart to what she was seeing in front of her much more moving painting in my uh, estimation, and, and I have to say in the world's too. I think uh, impressive as the skill is in that first early cassette, it would not have made her famous <laughs> as this painting and others like it have done. So I'm just suggesting that structure, important as it is, is not our final goal, right? Skill is not our final goal. Communication is our final goal, heart-to-heart um, -heart communication, and that comes from the energy of your body. I'm going to end by showing you a series of paintings by Vincent van Gogh, a painter whose work I, I trust you're somewhat familiar with. If you've been in my drawing classes, you've already seen a lot of van Gogh. I always start off by showing a, a series of paintings that he did of this man's wife. Uh, Joseph Rulan uh, was a postman and uh, he was a good friend of Van Gogh's and Van Gogh painted him many times. He also painted his wife many times, Augustine Rulan, and he painted their children many times. How do you think it felt to be the Van Gogh who was painting these? Same guy. Why? You're Van Gogh, right? Pretend you're Van Gogh. Why would you paint him? Again and again, like this. Here's a drawing that he did of Rulan. Why, why, why? Why would you paint the same guy? Would he not stay painted? Was there, did you feel you hadn't got him right? Did you want to try different compositions? I feel that Van Gogh was driven by something beyond words, something I can't describe, but something that he had to express. And he could express it 
by getting into that artist model relationship by responding to that model. The model brought different things out of Van Gogh each time he sat down in front of him. And Van Gogh never let himself just try to depict the man. We always feel Van Gogh's spirit there, Van Gogh's response, the energy of Van Gogh's body, right? One thing I want, one point that I want to make, because I'm going to be starting off with a drawing exercise to move you into painting, is that the very, very same things that happen with paint can also happen with drawing, all, all except color. And, uh, and of course, color is a, um, is a, is a big deal. It, it, you know, there's a lot to learn about color. But the, um, the body's energy can be expressed in drawing, and Van Gogh loved to do that, and he did a lot. So um, keep that in mind as you begin the, um, the dry into wet media exercise that we're going to be tackling this week. I, uh, I think if you could keep an image of this drawing in your mind, it would help you to remember that your body's energy is what's going to cause your work to be expressive. It's going to give the world that thing that only you have, right? No amount of skill will ever do that. It's got to be the energy of your body releasing the expression that you have inside. <laughs> sounds, sounds a little woohoo, but that's what I believe. That's why I paint. And, uh, and when I look at this, I feel, uh, I feel Van Gogh's presence with me. I think that's what painting can do and almost nothing else can do, right? Well, painting and music and art can do that. Art can do that, yeah. So um, let's make some art. Thank you for living with these with me.